Foundation and Museum and Libraries websites. Tonight's program is available by Zoom and Facebook. We are monitoring both of these sites for questions for a Q&A with the authors at the end of the program. Our next virtual program will be on November 17th with Harvard professor Frederick Hall. He will be discussing his book, JFK, Coming of Age in the American Century, 1917 to 1956. Please watch your emails and mailboxes for details on viewing that event. Our programming is possible to the support of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, members of the Friends of Ford, and the National Archives and Records Administration. Join me in welcoming Peter Baker and Susan Glasser as they explore the life and times of James A. Baker III, a retired trustee of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and the subject of their new book. A previous winner of the Gerald R. Ford Journalism Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency, Peter Baker is the Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times, a political analyst for MSNBC, and the author of Days of Fire and The Breach. Susan Glasser is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of its weekly letter from Trump's Washington, as well as a CNN Global Affairs analyst. Their first assignment as a married couple was as Moscow bureau chiefs for the Washington Post, after which they wrote Kremlin Rising. Joel Westfall, deputy director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, will be moderating tonight's event. Susan, Peter, and Joel, welcome. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, and thank you, uh, Peter and Susan, for uh, agreeing to do this uh, book talk about a uh, fantastic and amazing figure in American political history. Uh, how we will run tonight's program is I have a set list of questions which I have prepared myself. Um, and following that, we will get to the Q&A portion. Uh, if you have questions for Peter and Susan, uh, please put, place them in the Q&A chat and uh, we will get to those uh, shortly. So my, uh, my first question, um, having read the book, um, Jim Baker's father, um, he really never wanted him involved in politics. Um, in fact, uh, he, uh, he was in his late 30s when he actually began, began involved in politics. How did he eventually find his way into the political realm and so late in life? Well, thank you so much, uh, Joel, because I think the answer is very relevant to why we're having this conversation with you and the Ford Library and the Ford Foundation today, because in fact, uh, Jim Baker is a product of the Ford administration. Uh, and really, if it weren't for, you know, this sort of accident of timing in his own life that made him ready and interested to get into politics, which is something that his own family, by the way, was very much against. Uh, he was a fourth generation uh, Texan. His his father, great grand grandfather, and great grandfather had all been, you know, very prominent uh, lawyers, but also really builders of the city of Houston. And they had one family rule, and that was work hard, study hard, and stay out of politics. Uh, and you know, it was a very privileged, but also a very constraining world in many ways that Baker came from. And so in a way, it was sort of an act of rebellion and also a family tragedy, the death of his first wife at a young age that led him to be interested in politics. His best friend was George Herbert Walker Bush. But if it weren't for the Ford administration, none of this would have happened. Really, Watergate wiped out an entire generation, in effect, of uh, Republican Party operatives and so by the time Baker in his life was ready to make a kind of change like this, uh, he was literally able to go from a relatively obscure posting uh, in uh, President Ford's administration at, at the Commerce Department, which I can tell you being here in Washington was not the center of the action then and, or ever since. <laughs> and yet somehow he parlayed that within one year, he rose to become uh, President Ford's uh, running his campaign. So you mentioned Ford, and because we are with the Ford Presidential Library Museum, I'm going to answer a Ford-centric question. Um, I love in your book, uh, of course, one of the chapters is called The Miracle Man. Um, and he was called The Miracle Man uh, because of his running of the Gerald Ford campaign, which he held off a major attack from, uh, from, the far, from the far right in Ronald Reagan. 
and then uh, ran the 1976 campaign election, election. And then he kind of made it look like, even though, even though Ford lost, Baker came out of it as a, as a big winning figure. Uh, what led to that perception and why did he come out of that loss of that presidential campaign looking like a winner? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And uh, to repeat what Susan said, we're very grateful to the Ford uh, Foundation Library for, for hosting us. I've had the honor of being out there a couple of times to, to talk in the past. It's more fun in person, but I, we're grateful to everybody for doing it on Zoom. Uh, yeah, Baker, again, was sort of an accidental uh, miracle man using that title. That was a title that he was given at the 1976 convention, uh, the sort of code name that they used for their walkie talkies. They called him Miracle Man later got picked up by the New York Times in a headline. But he, he came so close to not having that happen. He only got there because while Under Secretary of Commerce, he had, he had impressed Raj Morton, who was the Secretary of Commerce, who had become Ford's campaign chairman. Uh, and when Jack Stiles, who was, of course, Ford's original campaign manager back in Grand Rapids when he ran for Congress, who was supposed to be the delegate hunter for the 76th convention, died tragically in a car accident, it's Raj Morton who says, hey, you should bring this, this, this kid Baker up, not so much a kid, he was 45, you should bring this young guy Baker up to be Jack Stiles' replacement. He does such a good job at the convention of, as you say, of holding off Reagan, even though that was a really dicey moment, that when Raj Morton is sort of eased aside as the campaign chairman, the next logical person then was Baker. So suddenly, boom, 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 he's in this position of extra extraordinary authority. And you're right, he doesn't win that campaign. So how does he come out ahead? Well, they had entered the camp, they had entered the convention 33 points down to Jimmy Carter. And by the end of the campaign had come to a hair's breadth away. If only 9,000 voters had switched their position in Hawaii and Ohio, Gerald Ford would have won the Electoral College and been elected on his own right in 1976. So it came so far from so far back. I think that Baker you know, really impressed people even though the final result was not a victory. Uh, one other fact I found interesting, again, early on in the book is it's 1980. Um, he is running the campaign for Herbert Walker Bush uh, in the Republican primary. Um, he, of course, Bush, 40, Bush 41 loses that, uh, that campaign to Reagan, yet somehow um, James Baker ends up as the Reagan's chief of staff. I mean, was this pure political maneuvering on Baker's part or was it something else? You know, that again is, you know, when you look at this career, you're, you are continually kind of amazed by these things that shouldn't by all rights happen, but that somehow managed to happen with him. And once again, it's, it's this combination of, you know, luck and skill and timing and impressing the right people uh, at the right moment. Uh, Imagine today, and you really can't imagine somebody who ran not one but two national campaigns, uh, you know, against Donald Trump becoming his chief of staff, right? Like it's obviously inconceivable. And Baker had run not only the Ford effort against Reagan in the 1976 primaries, but in 1980, his best friend was running for president. And of course, he was the campaign manager. Baker had impressed the Reagan camp back in 1976. And there, Reagan actually came and uh, did a fundraiser for uh, Baker in his one and only effort at elective office, uh, which was a failed 1978 race for Texas Attorney General. Uh, you know, in a way, it's a good thing he lost that because he probably never would have gone on to become uh, White House Chief of Staff and Secretary of State had he won that. <laughs> uh, but Reagan, you know, so there were ties between them after his debut in national politics. But in 1980, uh, you know, Bush ran uh, and became actually Reagan's principal challenger in the Republican primaries. And, you know, once again was sort of seen as the kind of occupying that Ford lane, the, the establishment Republican. Uh, and it started out really from nowhere. So Baker was seen as, as having run an excellent race, once again, taking a candidate from literally being an asterisk in the polls uh, to essentially consolidating the opposition to Reagan in the primaries. And yet ba Baker was very strategic. He was actually focused not so much on getting this chief of staff job for himself, but he was very focused actually on getting his friend George Bush onto the ticket as Reagan's vice president. And somehow he managed to do both things, which is remarkable. But, you know, the book has an interesting story, the backstory of how he got that chief of staff job. And 
basically it involves the, the sort of intrigue among Reagan's existing inner circle, which was a very faction ridden uh, intrigue filled group. And, you know, Peter can uh, tell the story of that, but I, I think it's a story as much about the Reagan world as it is about uh, Baker trying to get the job. This is the Ed Meese story. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's how he got pushed out, but it actually was Stuart Spencer and um, Michael Deaver who were intriguing right. to basically push Meese aside and to get Baker in. And this was even before the election, interestingly. Uh, they conspired to put Baker on Reagan's campaign plane and to give him some valuable face time in front of the candidate. Um, as a historian, oftentimes I'm, I'm a little intrigued with uh, kind of what ifs. And one of the ones that I, I kind of pointed at in the book was this issue of, uh, of Jim Baker becoming the national security advisor. Uh, yeah. that, it, that it is quite, pro that quite probably, and I think you argue about this in your book, uh, that, that Iran-Contra might not have occurred. And even of course, Reagan himself stated, and I'll quote a passage in your book, uh, my decision not to appoint Jim Baker as the national security advisor, I suppose was a turning point for my administration. And after all that, I mean, how did Jim Baker end up as the treasury, treasury secretary rather than the head of the national security advice? Right, yeah, that's one of the things I think we love the most about doing this book are these kind of what if moments, like the, the, how the hinges of history change and turn not just because of big forces of history, which of course obviously are super meaningful, but because Jim Baker met somebody on the tennis court in the Houston Country Club, and, they, and that happened to be George H. W. Bush, right? And suddenly his life would be, take a different turn if he hadn't. Or in this case, you know, he is tired of being chief of staff; it's an exhausting job, so he decides to kind of maneuver to become national security advisor. Convinces Reagan of it. Reagan's got the press release ready to announce. But first, he's got a meeting in the Situation Room with the National Security Team, and Baker makes one of his rare mistakes. He doesn't go with the president to the meeting. Well, at the meeting are all his enemies, all of Baker's enemies, and they discover what's about to happen, and they pile on Reagan and say, you can't do it, you can't do it. He's the biggest leaker in Washington. He doesn't know anything about national security. He can't do it. Baker comes up and says, to, uh, I'm sorry, Reagan comes up to Baker and Deaver says, sorry, fellas, I, I can't go through with it. And you're right, Baker, uh, Reagan later comes to regret it because Baker was so skeptical of the whole adventurism in Central America, there's almost no question he would have put a kibosh on this Iran-Contra scheme if he had known about it, and he would have run a tighter ship, presumably, than his successors. But McFarland and John McPoindexter end up going along with this scheme. They're the next uh, two national security advisors, and Baker, by this point, is in the Treasury Department, doesn't know anything about it. But you're right, so how does he become Treasury Secretary is another funny story. He's trying to mollify Don Regan, who at that point is the Treasury Secretary, who's mad about a leak in the paper. Baker comes over to his office and says, look, you don't really want to resign over this, not a big deal. And Don Regan calms down and Baker kind of slides in his chair. And he's all exhausted. And Regan says, you look really, you know, beat up and tired. He says, I am, I really am. This is after the 84 election. And Regan says, well, you know, I got an idea. Why don't we just swap jobs? Because Regan actually understood that the real power in an administration was being White House Chief of Staff, if done well, the way Baker did it. And Baker, for them, this is like the escape route. This is like uh, you know, Charlie and the Willy Wonka factory getting the golden ticket to the, to the, uh, to the, to the chocolate factory. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> anyway. no sale on that one. <laughs> All right. This is his escape route. He wanted to get out and he would be joining the cabinet. He would be a principal and no longer just a staff guy. So he jumps on the chance. Regan loves it too. The two of them swap jobs. Reagan goes along with it. And as you say, history is made because of that. Although interestingly, there's really still uh, some resentment among the, you know, kind of Reagan inner circle at the idea that, you know, Baker knew somehow that Reagan would be a terrible chief of staff. They blamed Reagan ultimately for, you know, the mishandling of uh, Iran-Contra and the sort of debacles of the early part of Reagan's second term. And, you know, there's a sense that, you know, Reagan, sort of, that Baker kind of got out while the getting was good, while perhaps knowing that he wasn't best serving uh, the boss, but um, you know, I do think that you know, as Peter said, he was he was seizing his opportunity to leave one of the most grueling jobs in Washington. And remarkably, by the way, he turned out to be quite a good Treasury Secretary. He had no background at all and no preparation at all to be Treasury Secretary. He had an undergraduate economics course at Princeton, which, by the way, he did not do all that well in. 
uh, no finance background, nothing. And it, it's really a quite a, a remarkable story about uh, what he was able to get done given all that. So I didn't have this question prepared, but because but Peter, you mentioned it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into this. And that was your comment about the leaking. Now, when you read this book, wow. I mean, you really get an understanding. Like if you think today there's leaking today, when you go and read this, when you go and read this book, I mean, I think James Baker had to have been the king leaker throughout the time when he was chief of staff. He really used a lot of it to his advantage. And even I, in my, if I recall, at one time, he nearly got in really trouble for it, where the president, uh, Ronald Reagan, threatened everybody either in the cabinet or in a, who was in a meeting to be um, uh, to go on and have a, a, a lie detector test. Yeah, that's right. He's right. Exactly right. Now, he, he was a leaker. Now, he would say differently. He would say, well, I wasn't leaking. I was backgrounding. Background, of course, being the way you talk to reporters when you don't want your name attached to it. And his argument would be that his leaking or backgrounding was in the service of the president in order to, to feed reporters and keep them more or less happy. And there's something to that, by the way. He did. He spent a lot of time on the care and feeding of reporters. And speaking of reporters, I think we generally approve we can of that. Support that. Yeah, we support that. Uh, you know, he would, every Friday he would have the news magazine reporters into his office, and he'd give them this behind-the-scenes tip, you know, tidbits that they love for those stories. And around six o'clock, if you know Sam Donaldson called the office saying, "What's the latest?" Uh, Baker would have something fresh to give him right before he went on the air. So he really understood how the media worked. Back in those days, if you had a bad story, you would bury it by announcing it Friday night. If you had a good story that you wanted to float, you would leak it out for the Monday morning paper. And he knew all these tricks. Did he start but, that? I'm curious. Did he start that principle? I don't think he started. I think he mastered it, right? I think that he was just sort of like really adept at it. Larry Speaks, who was the, uh, effectively the press secretary during Reagan, said that he thought that Baker spent 50% of his time dealing with the media. Now, that's probably an exaggeration, but it tells you how much he really did spend on that. In fact, he made a point of always returning every reporter's call before he went home for the night. Now, this is in the days that they didn't have texts and they didn't have emails. And so he knew if he returned it at eight o'clock at night, the reporter probably wouldn't be there. But he still made that effort. And I think that that did him well with a lot of reporters. Did he leak about his enemies and his adversaries like Ed Meese? Of course he did. That's the way things worked back then. It was a very uh, tough White House. In fact, I got an email or text actually from a Trump White House guy who's reading the book. He says, boy, I tell you, I thought our White House was, you know, was full of intrigue and, and backstabbing and palace intrigue. The only difference is that Baker was competent. Well, the other important difference was that he actually had a rule going back to that 1976 campaign, uh, don't lie to reporters. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons for why he was so well regarded by the press corps was because he more or less abided by that rule. And he had seen back in 1976 that it gave him enormous credibility with the national political reporter. John Sears, Reagan's campaign manager, uh, you know, was a big puff artist basically. And he kept saying, you know, giving inflated counts of uh, how Reagan was doing in the convention fight for delegates. And they turned out not to hold up. And uh, Baker sort of took the opposite course. And even when it wasn't uh, as advantageous to Ford, he would tell it more or less like it was. And he, he carried away from that experience the idea that, you know, credibility is the currency of the realm in Washington. And certainly when he then rose to be Reagan's chief of staff and in the cabinet, he was an aggressive spin guy, perhaps. He was aggressive at, you know, putting out their point of view. But he really, the reason that he was also, I think, so well regarded by the press was because he didn't lie to them. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, that's not something, obviously, that we're dealing with today. Yeah, the, non, the non-lying, the truth speaker really comes out across in the book uh, quite quite well. Um, just so everybody knows, uh, again, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, right now, we've got a couple. Um, and uh, if you have any more out there, please submit them. I'm going to ask two more and then move to our, our patrons and our clients' uh, our clients' questions. Um, so let's skip ahead um, to uh, 1988. And uh, Baker is now running the Bush 41 campaign. And uh, my, my question is, is uh, uh, please discuss uh, his role in one of the most infamous presidential campaign commercials in American history, the Willie Horton commercial. Right, exactly. Well, first of all, one thing you need to know about Jim Baker is he was a knife fighter when it came to elections. He was ruthless when he needed to be. He was not a softball. Ask Michael Dukakis or Al Gore or any of the others who faced him. The difference was when the election was over, then he would sit down with Democrats and go to work. But specifically about 
that campaign, I think you're right, that was sort of a precursor of a lot of the uh, uh, politics we would see in the, in, the, in the years to come in future cycles. Willie Horton, of course, had been released under the Massachusetts furlough program, went on to uh, rape and brutalize uh, a, a woman in Maryland and her boyfriend. And she, he became the symbol that the Bush campaign used, by the way, after Al Gore first used him in the primaries, to uh, paint Michael Dukakis' week on crime. Now, the famous commercial you're, that you're referring to and that people will remember was not actually produced by the Bush campaign itself. It featured Willie Horton's face and, and it a lot of people said it was racist because it seemed to be suggesting here's this scary black man. He's going to come and invade your house if Michael Dukakis becomes president. Well, that ad was produced by an independent organization, pro-Bush, pro-Republican, but not technically the campaign. Now, what Baker would say, I didn't do that ad. Our ad didn't use Willie Horton's name, didn't use his face, that they showed prisoners coming in and out of a turnstile, all of them except for one were white, and that they say that they weren't race baiting. But they didn't mind that Willie Horton was out there. In fact, Lee Atwater said, I'm going to make that Willie Horton to be Michael Dukakis' running mate when it's all over. So they they were trying to exploit Willie Horton, too. They just didn't happen to use that ad, which was pretty, uh, pretty uh, brazen, I think. And when we asked Baker about that years later, he allowed that perhaps that ad was, you know, over the top and too far, maybe something of a regret of his. But then he kind of backs off and says, well, look, overall, I think that campaign was, we did the right thing. We had to win. We went, went after the issues that were in front of us. And so I think that tells you a lot about, you know, campaigning in that era. Well, and just to, I mean, the whole point was if it wasn't Willie Horton, it would have been something else in that campaign because Baker, you know, is a very, very clear eyed realist when it comes to assessing any situation in front of him, whether it was a, you know, foreign policy situation or a political campaign. And the truth is, is that Michael Dukakis was killing George H.W. Bush. And they came out of the convention with a 17 point deficit in the polls. And Baker was actually just coming into the campaign uh, from being treasury secretary. In those days, campaigns didn't last forever, unlike uh, today. <laughs> and he looked at it and he very ruthlessly understood that there was really actually no way to come from behind. Americans were actually sick and tired of uh, Republicans after two terms of Reagan. Generally speaking in our history, that would have been a time for a democratic president to win. And the only way for Bush to win was to run a very ruthlessly negative campaign. And they succeeded in that. So it wasn't just Willie Horton. Uh, you know, Michael Dukakis was sort of a mild mannered Massachusetts technocrat. And they turned him into, you know, a sort of like wild eyed, crazy leftist liberal who was against the Pledge of Allegiance, who was, uh, you know, against, uh, you know, God and country, essentially. And the Willie Horton thing really fit very squarely within that campaign. Uh, and so he, he was against the flag. That was another thing. Uh, they literally wrapped uh, the president in the flag for that campaign. So, you know, I think. And you made immediate use of the issue with the M1 tank and driving around in the M1 tank with the helmet on. Well, that was a big mistake on uh, Dukakis's part. And that was right there in, in Michigan, right? Yes, it was. <laughs> um, my last question before we get to the, um, um, uh, the patron's question is in the book, actually early on in the book, um, there is a comment uh, that, uh, um, about Jim Baker. And I'm quoting uh, Tom Donnellan here, who was President Obama's national security advisor. Uh, he has he stated that Baker was the most important elect, unelected official since World War II. So with that with that phrase with that with that in mind, I mean, how does how does James Baker III compare with others like him uh, who were also never elected? Folks like Kissinger, John Foster Dulles, Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice. Right. That's a good question, I think. And I think you look at Kissinger and obviously he's sort of an iconic figure as a secretary of state, but Kissinger didn't run five presidential campaigns, right? And he wasn't a chief of staff and he didn't, uh, wasn't treasury secretary. He had one thing, he did it, uh, you know, obviously very prominently and very uh, uh, consequentially. And that was, uh, and that made him important in history, but Baker did politics and policy. You know, it's like Karl Rove and Kissinger rolled into one. Right. Imagine running five presidential campaigns. All, every, all four Republican presidents, from the end of Watergate to uh, you know to the early 2000s, at some point or another, depended on Jim Baker 
to help them run the country, run their campaign, to run the world. He had been Secretary of State when, when the Cold War ended, when Germany was reunified, when we fought the first Gulf War successfully. And I think that therefore Baker's uh, you know, role in almost every major thing that happens from the 76 convention, right, all the way through the 2006 Iraq study group, he has his finger in almost everything. In some form or another, he is, you know, this consequential figure. You may not like him, you may, you may agree, disagree with him, but he is a part of every part, you know, every major, uh, you know, action for a generation. And that's why this book is, is important from our point of view, because it's a study in power and how power works. And he is sort of an exemplar of that. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. We're going to get to our first question here, and our first question actually comes from I'm not going to say who it is, uh, a Ford Presidential Library and Museum uh, trustee. Um, right. And uh, the question is: Tell us about Baker's close, confident role with Nancy Reagan during the Reagan presidency. Hmm. You know, it's an excellent question because, as I said, Baker was a ruthless. Uh, 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 analyzer and understander of the world as it is, not the world as he would want it to be. And of course, as an astute a student of power, he understood who really had it, and that was Nancy Reagan. Uh, and so he knew that she played a crucial role, uh, not only with President Reagan himself, but you know, in, in that White House. Uh, and he early on made her an ally and an advocate, uh, including often at times she was even a back channel. Uh, and sometimes that involved him, by the way, uh, you know, conveniently ignoring things. Uh, you know, for example, he knew about the, uh, the consultations with the uh, astrologer that the first lady was undertaking, but did not even pass along that information to his own closest uh, confidants. Uh, so, you know, he, he was delicate and not, uh, you know, sort of upsetting that apple cart. And of course, uh, his successor, uh, as chief of staff, one of the you know things he did to run afoul in the Reagan White House was uh, to take on Mrs. Reagan, and you know Baker was just much too smooth of an operator early on. You know it's interesting because uh, Mrs. Reagan, like uh, Barbara Bush, like other uh, political spouses, right, has often been described as a sort of you know caring about loyalty and making sure that people were there you know for her Ronnie. Uh, but yet Baker was an interloper to this inner circle, right? He was a newcomer. He came from Bush world, but uh, something about him really impressed Nancy Reagan. And I think she thought he looked the part. Uh, he went out of his way to court her, uh, but he very quickly integrated himself with her. And I think she was a key ally. And by the way, when she passed away, it, it's notable that it was Jim Baker who was asked and did give the eulogy at her funeral a couple of years ago. I guess it's four years ago now. Okay. Um, the latter half of the book uh, pays attention to his, uh, his role as Secretary of State. And this question comes from uh, Paul. Uh, what was Jim Baker's biggest accomplishment as Secretary of State? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that, um, I, I think that the peaceful end of the Cold War has to rank right up there with one of the most extraordinary moments in our, in our modern history, right? Now, did Jim Baker or George H.W. Bush or even Ronald Reagan end the Cold War? No. Did they make the Soviet Union fall apart? No. Did they bring down the Berlin Wall? No, those were, those were actions taken by Russians, by Germans and so forth. But it's Jim Baker and George H.W. Bush in that period who take these forces of history that are, that are washing through Europe at that time and they try to harness them. And they try to direct them to a safe and peaceful landing. And I think that you could look at the reunification of Germany as a case study and how he made diplomacy work. You know, the Germans wanted to reunify, but it wasn't a given that that was gonna happen. The Soviets had 300,000 troops in East Germany. They could have stopped it with a you know, snap of the fingers if they wanted to. And it wasn't just the Soviets who were against it. It was our allies. It was the British, Margaret Thatcher. It was the French and Francois Mitterrand. They had fought two wars against Germany. They didn't want to reunify Germany on their border. And then you had the Germans themselves, not just the East Germans versus the West Germans. You had the West Germans versus the West Germans because their own government was fragmented into this coalition. And Baker took all of these moving parts and helped find a way to create a formula that within just one year of the, of the fall of the wall brought the two Germanys together again, which was in remarkable time, just 30 years ago this past weekend, I think it was. And if you think about what could have happened had they delayed a little bit, 
the Iraq invasion of Kuwait might have happened, the Soviet coup against Gorbachev might have happened, and that would have completely bollocked things up completely. So I think that you could look at that as a case study in where individuals and diplomacy actually do matter, even amid the larger forces of history. I like this next question, and because I, again, after reading the book, it, it kind of takes uh, takes me down memory lane. It really it, it's a lot of reminiscing about the times in Washington where where there was uh, where there was bipartisanship, uh, and people uh, often came to the table to make deals. Um, the question is question comes from Christie. Uh, currently, there is quite a bit of tension between political parties. Do you think we can move back to a more bipartisan Washington? which you really do a quite, quite a fantastic job about illustrating in the book. You know, I think, Christy, that's a great question because, you know, how much of this is a, a structural shift in our politics, right? Like, that's really the question. And the answer is a lot of it, right? So the incentives uh, are really different than they were in Baker's time. And by the way, Baker was a big, super competitive guy. Uh, and the path to winning uh, politics in those days actually did go through accomplishment, right? So he had a huge incentive to make those deals, uh, A, because he uh, thought they were the right thing to do, but B, because that also was the recipe for political success uh, in a world where you're trying to get the biggest possible coalition to vote for you. Uh, you know, that makes sense, right? It also was a political reality. There was divided government through most of Reagan's tenure, through all of Bush's tenure. He, he, he had to go through uh, the Democrats in the House of Representatives because that was the only power that mattered in the House of Representatives the entire time uh, Reagan and Bush were in office, right? So that structural incentive has changed. And of course, the nature of how our politics is conducted has changed. Uh, permanent campaigning, uh, aiming to the base. Our media has fragmented in a way such that you can narrow cast uh, to a small segment of people and rely upon them to turn out. People talk about this as you know, essentially giving up on persuading the mass of voters and simply mobilizing the ones who are already on your side. So Baker was operating in a very different political environment. However, I would like to caveat and say he also truly is a natural deal maker, uh, and he's much more skilled uh, at it than you know many of the you know so, sort of so-called practitioners of it today. And I got to think that even in today's gridlocked, sclerotic, dysfunctional Washington, look at the COVID uh, relief package that has been sitting in front of Congress, and nothing has happened since April. For the American people, with millions of people out of jobs, with you know, 210,000 plus dead in the pandemic, I just I have to say that I, I find it hard to imagine that Jim Baker wouldn't have found a way uh, to get a relief package in front of the American people. Uh, next question comes from uh, Sean, uh, and that is, uh, what was Baker's role in helping uh, Reagan deal with the Iran Contra crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. His role was to keep 100 feet away from it, basically. You know, he wanted nothing to do with it. <laughs> now, he did. There's a great uh, memo in the book about a meeting that is held without Baker, actually, in which his name is invoked, in which he, everybody says, well, Baker says it would be illegal and possibly impeachable if we, uh, if we do what we're talking about doing. And some of the advocates would say, ah, you know, Baker doesn't know what he's talking about. And so rather than listening to Baker's own advice, uh, they plow forward and go even further than Baker knew that they ever went. When Baker discovers as Treasury Secretary that all this has been going on, it all begins to break out in public. Uh, he runs into John Poindexter, who was a national security advisor, of course, one of the architects of the whole scheme. And Poindexter says to Baker, well, you know, Mr. Secretary, I'm sorry for leaving you out of the loop. And Baker says to him, John, that was the biggest favor you could ever do with me. Um, next question. Um, this one's from Thomas. Uh, as an admirer of Baker and as an NGO executive and humanitarian uh, that worked in uh, South Africa and the Middle East, would you speak to his ability to put concern for suffering people high on his agenda after he was out of active politics? Uh, he's thinking more primarily of his ability to hold senior leaders in Israel, Palestine, and South Africa uh, because of his reputation to account uh, to get them to be more socially oriented uh, before and after his effect of gov on government life. Well, you know, it's, it's, that's an interesting question. I mean, Baker is certainly not a standard issue 
uh, Republican, for example, he's very active on uh, climate change right now. He's been working with other Republicans on a carbon tax proposal. So, you know, he's he's definitely he's very much a con uh, committed conservationist uh, and has done a lot of work uh, in Africa on that issue. Uh, you know, he's a real he's an outdoorsman. He, he's a hunter as well, but primarily, I would say, a, sort of an outdoorsman, an environmentalist in the mode of George Herbert Walker Bush himself. Um, but I will say that as a diplomat, and when he was in office, Baker was absolutely unsentimental view of the world. Uh, and he did not make human rights or values uh, a core part of uh, his diplomacy and his view of foreign uh, affairs does not include uh, that. You know, he is somebody who absolutely is a huge believer in international alliances uh, and working with partners around the world. Uh, and, and that was, I think, the key in many ways to his, his Cold War diplomacy. But he very, very wary, a deep and intuitive, uh, uh, almost a visceral dislike of the militarization of American foreign policy and the idea of American adventurism as he would see it uh, around the world. So, you know, he, he would not be somebody who would be threatening uh, military action because of a human rights violation, for example. Uh, so they were strongly worded, both he and Bush, when it came to things like Tiananmen Square or um, uh, Soviet crackdowns uh, in some of the Baltic states that were struggling for their independence. But they really didn't shift American policy uh, to match that rhetoric with, with their words in many ways. Yeah, I think on the Israel-Palestine, this is an example. Yeah. Like, so he's so far, this is how far the Republican Party has come. He, he was not a pro-Israel, you know, do or die, you know, won't we'll, we'll question them no matter what kind of kind of Republican. That that's today's Republican Party. Back then, he was quite critical of Israel. It wasn't because I think he had a human rights, uh, you know, feeling for the Palestinians per se. He just thought that the Israeli settlements were unconstructed, that they, they made it harder to come to a deal. It was a very unsentimental view of it, right? Settlements were an obstacle to coming to peace. I don't think he was necessarily offended per se by uh, by them as a moral issue. I just think he saw it as, as a practical thing, uh, as, 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 a, as a waste of time uh, and, a, and a waste of uh, an opportunity to come together. Uh, I'm gonna ask another question of my own, if you people don't mind. Uh, and because it was mentioned about his uh, capability, his deal-making uh, was, was brought up. Um, and that was his role um, following the invasion of Kuwait uh, and how he was able to bring such a large coalition together uh, to, uh, to re reinvade Kuwait and, and kick out uh, Iraq. Can you kind of, uh, kind of go over uh, his role in that? Well, I have to say, first of all, this is the first war in American history that almost turned a profit as a result of Baker's coalition building skills. So clearly, he was very good and he really got on, a, you know, called it his tin cup tour and, you know, hopped on an airplane and basically never got off. Uh, although, interestingly, it really was Bush himself more so than Baker, I think, who was uh, determined to, you know, this aggression shall not stand, right? You remember that phrase of Bush's and he was leading rather than following his advisors when it came to the issue of, you know, really wanting to have a forceful uh, military response. What Baker brought as you said, was the coalition building skills, including remarkably bringing the Soviets along in this. And, 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 and Baker's advisors at the State Department saw the opportunity here. And in fact, they actually wrote a memo to him and they said, this is the first test of the post-Cold War era. And Baker saw Saddam's invasion very much in that light. And he wanted, he was very close working partners at this point with the Soviet foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze. And the two of them actually flew together and gave a joint statement about the initial invasion, which was really unprecedented. For 40 years, you had a situation where the world had been divided into two camps. Uh, and either you were with us or you were against us. And that held for basically every major foreign policy issue up until that moment of uh, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait in which you actually had the world's two <laughs> nuclear superpowers standing together and saying in this new world that we envision, uh, you know, violations of international sovereignty and international law like this will not be agreed upon. So it really was um, a remarkable moment that Baker sees in the context of his Soviet diplomacy, as well as just his natural kind of diplomatic and deal-making skills. Our next question comes from William. Um, 
He writes, uh, you are so correct about uh, JAB3. I had the honor of working with him, with him under uh, at US Treasury during Reagan's second term. Uh, he was revered by all at Treasury and was the consummate pro. Where and how in his family or personal background did, did he get his strength, stamina, and devotion to process? That's a great question. It's really interesting. You know, he, it's, it's his staff would call him, you know, like this sort of the, the marathon man. I mean, he could just go early morning, late night. He seemed to be uh, endlessly uh, energetic. Uh, I think he, you know, he came from a family in Houston that had basically been a family of winners, a family of succeeders. They had built modern Houston in some ways. And the legacy of that for Jim Baker, who turned out to be the way the fourth Jim Baker, even though he's the third, we spent <laughs> seven years working on this book. I still don't understand why he's the fourth man named James Addison Baker, but his name is James Addison Baker. They the don't third. have a good explanation. No, they really don't. We even <laughs> mentioned that to Baker, I must say, in a recent event about this book. He still didn't offer no, any uh, no further clarification. But I do think that family history, the family, you know, the expectation that you were going to succeed, that you were going to, you know, that you were going to be a major force in your community, uh, you know, was a driving uh, factor in his life. And I think that he translated that to politics in a way his father and grandfather and great grandfather didn't. But I think that, you know, he respected process, he respected institutions, maybe some of the lawyer background helped in that regard. As Susan said, he didn't have a background in economics. He didn't have a background in international affairs. What he had a background in was success. Like, and I think success breeds success. Once you're seen as a winner, that aura comes with you. And he also was good about staff. I think he picked a good staff. He brought them with him. He wasn't afraid to have people who were smarter than him. And they challenged him at times. He didn't always necessarily get along with the career staff who sometimes resented the these political people who followed him from place to place. But eventually I think they, like a State Department, for instance, you would see in the histories, all these ambassadors who say, well, you know, he didn't really use us. But in the end, I think they appreciated that under him, that was the place where the action happened. You know, that the State Department, when Baker was in charge of the State Department was the center of the action. That's not always the case. All right, uh, the next question, um, we'll, let's see here. Um, Tell us something that uh, really this uh, question question comes from Carol. Um, please tell us something that really surprised you in uh, in your research, uh, the writing or the writing of the book. Well, that's a great question. I you know I like a lot of people. I love biographies, but I really I'm a, I'm usually like the first part of biographies better. Uh, you know, you, you pick up a book and you know at least something about the dazzling resume of a Jim Baker or a you know president when you decide to read a book like that. But, you know, I didn't know anything about Baker's background and what led him into politics. And I was surprised uh, by what I found because first of all, there really is this incredible kind of family tragedy and accident of history that it, it's not just that he meets George Bush, right? Like, you know, it's, it's not like the preppy kind of country club cocktail party friendship that I thought perhaps it was. Uh, you know, but really a deep bond. And the, the sort of most moving thing that we found was that when Baker's first wife, Mary Stewart, he had fallen in love with her when they were still in college, they met on the beach in Bermuda. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer at a, a very early age. She was still in her thirties. They had four young sons at this time. Baker was living this very conventional life. I mean, you know, a life of great privilege, but also really a very constrained life, you know, of, of duty and obligation. Uh, and uh, his wife gets this terrible diagnosis. And there's this letter that is in our book that, that's really never been published before, in which he confides this awful fact to George Herbert Walker Bush. And he says, I haven't told Mary Stewart herself, which by the way, tells you a lot about 1969 and how the world has changed. Uh, I haven't told my wife, I haven't told my mother, I haven't told our children, but I'm telling you, George. Uh, and, you know, look, that's that's a secret, that's a bond, uh, like no other that you can imagine people carrying into public life uh, all those decades later. So that was really eye-popping for me in a way that I did not expect. And it, it tells you a lot about the man, that he enter politics almost as a rebellion to the family as opposed to the natural progression. You might think that, well, he's a privileged son of Texas and this was just, you know, his family connections or something, but actually it was quite the opposite. 
And it really was his final act of assertion of independence against a very controlling father, I must say. Uh, when he told us <laughs> that he and his friends uh, called his father the warden, uh, you know, and that my, I said, okay, now I understand. Now I understand a little bit better. Wasn't there also a really touching letter that you have in the book from his, uh, his first wife to him? Right, because in fact- well, Can you expand on that a little bit? Exactly right, you know, that's the next part of the story. Because although he didn't tell Mary Stewart, Mary Stewart of course knew, right? He didn't want to ruin her last few months uh, of life by, you know, confronting directly the fact that they, everybody knew that she was going to die, but she knew. And she wrote him a letter and she left it hidden in the dresser in their home. And when she passed away, she had told her friend, Susan Winston, to, to find the letter and give it to Jim. Jimmy, she called him. And we, Jim Baker gave us this letter and it's in the book. I don't think that's ever been published before. And it's this heartbreaking letter in which she, you know, expresses her love for him, from, basically left from the grave, you know, behind. She says, you would love my life. I wish I could be there to see you and the four boys as they grew up, uh, but you've meant everything to me and so forth. And even when we interviewed him about this in his late eighties, he still teared up, you know, almost a half century later. Uh, but the woman who helped him find the letter ended up becoming his second wife. So in the end, the story has uh, some twists and turns to it. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a great, uh, great, great part of the book. It was really touching. Um, next, uh, next question. Um, did he ever consider running for, I mean, I, we know he, he, was, he thought about it. He, I believe he ran for attorney general in the state of Texas, but did he ever consider <laughs> running for office other than that at that time, president, anything? You know, the answer is yes, he did consider running for president in 1996 after, uh, you know, uh, Bush had lost for the second term. Uh, but the truth is that uh, he really wasn't likely to have much chance for success. And uh, we had this sort of very interesting moment. We were visiting uh, Baker and his wife, Susan, at their home in Texas. And we asked him about that. Why didn't you run in 1996? He had uh, great approval ratings. He was pretty well known. Uh, you know, he could have raised a lot of money. Uh, he was very well respected, certainly by the party's leadership. Uh, but, you know, so he's saying all this, he's saying, well, I was exhausted after all these years in Washington. And his wife, Susan, was fantastic. She just sort of like let the air out of the balloon. And she said, listen, honey, you know, like the party had left you. I mean, you know, you weren't really the right candidate for that moment in time. They saw you as much too liberal. Now, he wasn't actually liberal in a sort of ideological sense, but this was the Gingrich era of maximum confrontation and Jim Baker didn't play that kind of politics. He was seen as an establishment Republican, a country club Republican, uh, a, a product of a, a kinder and less confrontational moment. So she gave the right answer. I one, which is the reason that he didn't run. Um, let's see, I, I already asked that one. Um, this is a more, uh, maybe a Michigan centric question. Um, how would you compare Baker's impact on the post, on post-World War II, for example, to Arthur Vandenberg? That's interesting, yeah. Uh, I mean, Vandenberg was super important, right? Because obviously his, his pivot from isolationism to internationalism presages the whole party's movement. I mean, I think you can certainly make the case that Vandenberg is a, is a pivotal figure in the post-war uh, era that, that, that leads to Eisenhower in some ways, right? As opposed to Taft. And, uh, and without that, you wouldn't have the, the bipartisan consensus that more or less governed through the 40 years of the Cold War. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't in any way take anything away from Vandenberg by saying that we think Baker uh, was a singularly important figure in the post-Cold War era. I think Vandenberg, I've got his biography sitting on my nightstand, as a matter of fact, uh, was, was, uh, was truly on the list of top 10, you know, American figures who was, uh, other than being president, probably pretty, pretty central to, to the post-war era. Well, what I would say is that, you know, if Vandenberg was the party's uh, World War II to post-World War II pivot, right, from the, you know, the pre-war uh, America firsters and isolationists to the post-war internationalists who built, uh, you know, kind of this modern order. Baker, Jim Baker was essentially the character of the next great political pivot. And he is a product of uh, the, the transformation of the Republican Party into what it is today and a, a Southern based Republican Party uh, where, uh, you know, there was a whole new kind of uh, coalition 
that governed. It was the death of the old line Eastern establishment Republican Party, uh, which literally does not exist today. Uh, and how many uh, Republican members of Congress are there from uh, you know, the New England states that created the modern Republican Party, right? There's none, literally none. Uh, and Baker, you know, grew up his whole life as a Southern Democrat, uh, a, not a very active one, but, you know, a Southern Democrat, and yet was sort of the this new wave Republican Party. So in a way, you could sort of see him as a successor uh, to that previous era of shift in politics that Van Ber Vandenberg represented. Uh, next question. Um, Baker did not want to return to the Bush campaign in 42 and 92, uh, but he did. Uh, if he had been able to get uh, Nick Brady and Dick Darman out as part of the bus September Detroit Econ Club speech, could Bush have found a path to victory over Clinton? It's a great question. Um, you know, is it possible? Yes. Uh, I think that, but I don't think that necessarily would, would have changed the overall uh, arc of that, of that election at that point. Baker, you know, Bush in, in, in the end wins just 38% of the vote. You know, I think people at that point uh, had soured on him and a little like Churchill after World War II, you know, a person who obviously is great, has great success on the foreign affairs stage and then, and then fa fails to, to convince people that he knows what he's doing on the domestic stage. Baker was resistant to coming back. You're absolutely right. He literally cried the day he left the State Department. He tried to, to get out of it by faking, uh, talking about faking a Middle East peace mission at the end in order to stay at state. In the end, he obviously couldn't do that. He knew he had to come back to help his friend Bush. And he resisted as long as he could. And when he did come back, he was sort of half-hearted about it. I mean, his own staff would go to him and say, what are you doing? Why aren't you more involved? And he would say, I am, what are you talking about? They went to his wife and they said, you gotta get him more engaged. But it may not have been, it may have been just too late. I mean, the truth is if Baker had come in earlier in the year, if he'd come in in say February or March when some people were agitating for him to come, may and he'd come more full-hearted, full maybe he could have turned it around. No question, everybody in the Bush White House was relieved when he showed up because they did see in him again that aura of a winner and thought he could make a difference. And he did uh, tighten up the ship pretty quickly. The, the, the odds were already pretty long at that point. And clearly it, it was so long that it, it, uh, you know, he, didn't, uh, uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't make that difference. So this uh, next question also comes, uh, well, comes from Christy um, and it ties into the last one. How did the Bush-Baker relationship change over the years? Hmm. You know, I think that was one of the more interesting uh, sort of questions we set out with in the book. And uh, we were very interested to find that it really evolved and shifted over time. Baker described to us uh, that he was almost dazzled by George Herbert Walker Bush when he first met him. Uh, and it's, it's hard for us all to sort of let go of the image we have of him later in life. But Bush was really, he was a pretty dazzling figure at this early stage, right? He had been a hero, uh, a World War II hero, you know, the youngest uh, naval aviator. Uh, Baker was too young to serve in that war. Uh, he uh, served in the Marines during the Korean War era, but he did not serve in the war, right? So, you know, Bush has this sort of war hero thing. His father is Prescott Bush, who's a senator from Connecticut, but Bush has gone off and broken away uh, from the family in a way that Baker did not have yet, you know, the, the sort of moxie to do, right? Bush has left Connecticut behind and come to Texas to seek his fortune. And so Baker looked up to him as kind of an elder brother, especially he then gets into politics. He wins a seat in Congress. He's immediately pegged as an up and comer. And I think that really impressed Baker initially. Uh, although they both allow that they were super competitive on the tennis court, but Baker might've been the better player. Uh, and actually had been the two-time club champion at singles when he was teamed up with uh, Bush as a doubles partner. You know, so, you know, they both brought advantages to the relationship, but, um, you know, that did change, like, especially when they're at the height of national politics and Baker becomes Reagan's chief of staff and Bush is his vice president. And I think Baker realizes then, wow, you know, I, I don't have the fancy title, but there's no question that I have more power day to day. And I'm the one essentially running the government right now. And I think that was a major shift uh, in the Reagan years in the, the sort of balance of power between the two. And of course, another key moment of real tension was that 92 campaign that Peter just talked about. Uh, and, you know, especially Barbara Bush, there were some real uh, sourness and real hard feelings after that had Baker really done enough uh, to 
do what he could to pull Bush out of this disastrous, you know, and embarrassing uh, loss in 92. But, you know, it tells you everything you need to know that it was Jim Baker there uh, literally rubbing George Bush's feet when he died uh, and weeping at his at his funeral. Um, while I'm looking for the next question where there is a request to see your dog. One of you know, Sorry, one Ellie is a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's here. Yeah, come here. Come yeah, here. She heard. Sorry, we're sorry about that. Yeah. She is very beautiful, we think. And she also just had a cameo on the Showtime show, The Circus, which I don't know if any of you uh -huh. watch it, uh, but it's a very, it's kind of a good like uh, documentary style take on uh, uh, this presidential campaign. And they showed up last week in our backyard uh, to film us. And somehow, I think Ellie was on camera longer than uh, Peter was. <laughs> She's better. <laughs> the next question is, uh, this is from, uh, from Ray. Um, what intrigued you about James Baker III to even start the writing process, to even write the book? I think we were, um, we started back in 2013 and uh, it was even before Trump came along and we were talking a lot about what was broken in Washington. And, you know, Baker was such a, 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 a exemplar of how Washington could work when things you know, were different. And I think we wanted to kind of explore that a little bit. We were surprised that nobody had even written a biography of James Baker. A lot of secretaries of state have had biographies written about them. They haven't done very much. Here's this guy who had been secretary of state when the world changed and nobody had written about him. And I think the last thing I was, we were talking about this and we were discussing it and I was in a cab in, Cle in Cleveland one day and, we, and the driver and I were talking about how screwed up things were in Washington. He said, yeah, you know, if only we had a Jim Baker there right now. And I was really struck that a cab driver in Cleveland would remember Jim Baker as an example of how things could be. And I thought, well, if that's the case, then we ought to look at a guy like this. And he, he wanted to cooperate. That made for a, 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 a better book. He opened his archives to us unfettered. He gave us all the hours of interviews we could want. We interviewed all eight of his children. We interviewed his 107-year-old nanny. She's still around, 107. So we really enjoyed, I think, having open access to such an interesting life. How many interviews in total across the board? Is it, I think I was, was it 200, more than 200 oh, interviews? 200, 215, yeah. something, something like that. that. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing hours. amount of, yeah. of interviews. Yeah. And where, where did you do most of your uh, of the research at? Was that the presidential libraries? Was that other, other, other facilities? Just curious. We had some from your library, which was great. We had some help, uh, really terrific help there. And we uh, did some, obviously, Reagan and Bush. But the primary places were the Princeton uh, archives where Baker has put his secretary, most of all his papers there, and also some at Rice University, which is you yeah, know, the Baker, Institute. Baker Institute down there. And then he also gave us some boxes of papers that frankly weren't in either one. So we were really lucky to have a, a real paper trail of his life. There's a question here about the letter that you had mentioned about uh, from George Bush uh, from Baker to George Bush about his wife's condition. Uh, is it at, is it currently available in the Bush archives um, and was uh, Secretary Baker at all reluctant to share it with you? I don't believe it is available in any archives. He shared it with us when we talked to him about it. And I think, uh, I don't think he was really reluctant. I think he understood that, you know, if you're gonna understand his life, you had to understand this chapter in it. And even though he's not an introspective guy, even though he's not a, um, you know, a, a motive type of person, I think he understood that that was important to understand his life. Yeah, no, he was really, he understood that, you know, he, he even now he's turned 90 and, uh, you know, he is a very savvy figure. And I think he understood that to really be a figure in history, it's not enough to have written two memoirs of your own. And he has yes, he written has. two memoirs of his own. Uh, but he understands that you need an independent uh, work by, you know, respected independent people. And he really, I think he understood very clearly what he was doing. I, I That was the biggest surprise. Somebody asked that earlier. That was the biggest surprise for me. Jim Baker was known and is, in fact, a very canny steward of his own reputation, uh, you know, very adept at, you know, spinning and manipulating the press. And he he never did that with us. And I really was... Um, a little surprised and, we didn't know it. you know exactly we, or he's done such a good job uh, that we didn't they know were uh, but no he, he answered not. all of our questions mm -hmm. and especially for a, a gentleman of the old school which he very mm -hmm. much is uh he wasn't introspective but he managed to be very open about i think difficult 
subjects uh, that you might not have expected, you know, an 88 year old to be willing to talk he, to you about. He didn't try to put anything off on us. He didn't try to rule anything out. And he wasn't really defensive about anything. They talked about their own family troubles of which there were quite a few in a very open and, and candid way, I thought. He's more defensive about the fights of the Reagan White House in some ways than he is about what happened in mm. his family. Because you've done so, you have so many hours of interviews with, uh, with the secretary. Uh, this next question, uh, comes uh, again from another uh, Ford trustee, um, but I'm going to expand on the question a little bit. Um, his que the question is, is, did he have any regrets not running for national office? And I'm going to add in, did he have any regrets at all about anything that he did or did not do when, while, serving, uh, while serving his country? I think not he, a man of regrets. No, he's not a man of regrets. He, I think he regrets not being president, but I don't think he regrets not running for president, right? I think he would have enjoyed being president because he's good at it. I don't but know he's he, self-aware enough to know. That's yeah. the thing. He's a realist about himself as well as others. He wasn't good as a candidate. Uh, you know, we talked to uh, someone who covered his 1978 Texas Attorney General race. You know, he would go to state fairs in Texas and whatever the opposite of kissing babies was is what he did. He would walk right past the people. He wasn't asking for their vote. George W. Bush, Peter had an interview with President Bush and who also was running that same year, who loves Jim Baker and who said like, listen, the guy really was not a good candidate, okay? So I think Jim Baker understood that, you know, electoral politics wasn't for him. You know what he regretted? He regretted that Bush did not win a second term and that he couldn't go back to be the Secretary of State, and he didn't get his shot at that big, all-encompassing Middle East peace deal, which of course eludes us to this day. That was a big regret for him. Uh, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Bush forty three, and there is a question uh, that came in um, about, and a lot of people don't know this, and this is I'm really happy you included this in, in your book, is about Jim Baker's role following the two thousand election in Florida. Can you talk a little about a little bit about that? Yeah, and it feels a little relevant today if we are looking at a potential contest after the current election. Look, in, in, when uh, uh, George W. Bush ran for office, he didn't want to be seen as his daddy's guy. So he didn't have people like Jim Baker involved in the campaign, kept an arm's distance away. But when the election day came and suddenly it all came down to a few hundred votes in Florida, the first person he got on the phone with to say, hey, come help, was Jim Baker. And again, because it, Baker had that aura of confidence and an aura of a winner, uh, the Democrats told us that they knew the minute he was picked, they were toast, that they, they were going to be in real trouble because Baker just, you know, uh, was more suited to that role than, for instance, Warren Christopher, who was a very respected former Secretary of State on the Democratic side, but not a knife fighter, not a political guy in the way that Baker was. And they show up at this meeting, Baker sits down with Christopher, and Christopher thinks they're going to arrange this two wise men, elder statesmen, they're going to figure out this problem in Florida together. And Baker's like, no, I'm here to, I'm not here to negotiate. Uh, my guy won, I'm here to preserve his victory. And he did. And he, they had a tough fought, uh, campaign all the way through the Supreme Court. Uh, but, uh, and, and there are a lot of people to this day who are disappointed. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think compared to what we see today, Baker and particularly Gore and Bush all had a respect for the system and didn't try to then delegitimize it or question the credibility of American elections the way we're seeing today. Um, this will be the last uh, question, uh, and it will come, and it comes from Marge. Marge, um, and of course, when you read the book, one of the themes of the one of the themes that I saw in the book is, of course, a lot of outdoors, a lot of outdoorsmanship, a lot of uh, hunting. Uh, you talk about his his uh, um, trip with his father, uh, his trip to uh, Africa, the safari. And of course, uh, throughout the, his entire life, the, you know, the hunting, the outdoorsmanship. Um, and so this question from Marge, what, what does Jim Baker do in retirement? Does he enjoy his downtime? <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a good question. So this is amazing. He's 90, I mentioned, he turned 90 earlier this year uh, during the height of the lockdown this spring. And uh, he and his wife, uh, Susan actually contracted the coronavirus uh, early, you know, the, by the end of the summer. Luckily, they're okay. Uh, this man is made of really strong stuff. And uh, when our the week that our book came out, he was actually off elk hunting in Wyoming with his son and grandson. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, this is what he probably loves most in life. Uh, he really is. I think Peter and I found him to be a, a just a natural outdoorsman and that's where you know he really is is at his happiest 
uh, is doing that. And he's definitely done that. Although, you know, he still maintains an office at Baker Botts, the firm uh, that his uh, grandfather, great grandfather were essentially the, the founders of. Uh, which at one time was the largest law firm west of the Mississippi. Now, I, I guess nobody really goes into the office anymore, but, uh, you know, he still is working uh, at, at least to a certain extent today. It's really, he's a very, very, I think there's something about being Secretary of State. The people who make it to those jobs have incredible constitutions. <laughs> you know, look at Madeleine Albright, look at George Schultz. Uh, they're both uh, still going strong. Well, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. This was uh, fantastic. Um, I congratulate you on your success as journalists. Um, I really applaud you for your body of work over these, uh, over these years. America, I'm sure, appreciates, uh, appreciates that work. Um, and uh, the book, I can say, is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, it's, it's a really a great, great read. Um, and I believe if you're interested in, in it, uh, you can go into our chat bar and find the location where you can uh, purchase uh, the book, of course, we're uh, the, the library museum is still closed at this time. We hope to be open in the very uh, near future, but we still don't expect, of course, to have uh, book uh, book talks with actually sales and people queuing up in lines and that type of thing for who knows when. We hope it's soon. We do not know. Um, but again, thank you both uh, for this wonderful talk and going over the history of a, a truly remarkable American. Thank you so much. Thank this you, is Joel. wonderful. And wonderful questions from your audience. Thank too. you to the audience for chipping yeah. in. That's a norm for us. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you set a high standard. Thank you very much. And stay safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Good night. To our patrons, thank you.